Hey, welcome to The Deeper Dive. The Deeper Dive, we go deep into some subject of the previous week's message. I'm here with the three pastors. Good to see you guys, all from Bethel Church. Gentlemen, how was your weeks? How was your week? How was your past week, I should say? Weekends. Weeks. Pretty good. Things go well. Can't, can't go wrong with a good holiday weekend, man. Yes, exactly. Right. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we have been, if you were here with us last week, we talked about Cornelius. One of the things we talked about Cornelius was his ministry as a, uh, as a bridge builder, right? And um, uh, uh, Barnabas as well as a bridge builder. And just, you know, I was actually listening to last week's podcast and just how profoundly needed are people who are bridge builders. Part of the pre- reason we need bridge builders is because there are gaps, right? There's just gaps between us and other people gaps between people and people and it's like how, how, how are we gonna how are we gonna get over those gaps does, does that make sense to you guys when mm-hmm. i say that yeah well like for example like what are some of the gaps that you are that we are seeing in our churches whether it's pasco prosser or richland mm-hmm. that need to, needed to be crossed gaps like within the church or gaps from the church to what we would call the thirty-six, thirty, right? That the percent that Bethel is called to reach. Yeah, that's a good question. How, like, like I would say both, Matthew. Like, start off with even within the church. What are some of the gaps that we, you know, we need to we need to have our eyes open to? We need to see, and we need to we need to cross. In the church, I would start with politics. Like, there's a big gap um, between a whole lot of believers uh, where they have a hard time even fathoming someone being a Christian who wouldn't vote like them. And we need bridge builders who can help mm-hmm. make those connections for them. Yeah. Not polarize people, but show them how the gospel unites. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned po- political, but also there's an economic bridge that we have to cross. I was looking at some, some demographic information for the Tri-Cities. I was amazed that Kennewick, that 18, I think it was 18.2 or 18.5 of people in Kennewick live below the poverty line. Yeah, and it was a very close number in Prosser. Mm-hmm. And a closer number in Pasco, not that close in Richland. But um, you know, I made the comment too, like that's you know we're, we're assuming also the poverty line is not like the standard. The poverty line is pretty low, so even the people right. between poverty line and median income is very large. And so there are that many people living in poverty; they have to be part of the thirty six thirty. So we have to be willing to cross the bridge and not see people in a different economic class as a project or look down on them, but actually to engage and be a part of their life and welcome them into our life. So I think you have your political, economic, I think there's an ethnic piece too, like the statistic. I was amazed, like Pasco is almost 60% Hispanic. Prosser was over 50% Hispanic. Yep, 60%, yeah. And Kennewick was, ah oh man, I want to say it was in the 30%. So even like an ethnic, like we have to be able willing to cross those bridges with people in a way that is meaningful and contextualized to them so we can build bridges. Other, otherwise, we're going to reach only a segment of people in this area and not like the full gamut of folks that are making 3630. And then there's like a broader level too, though, where like there's just a big gap between people who are in the church and outside the church. Yeah. That's reality. Like I ask people all the time, like, hey, if you've never shared your faith, which turns out that's a shockingly high amount of believers. Yeah. Why? And like one of the answers I get back like a ton is like, well, I don't know any non-believers. And I'm like, statistically unlikely. I think what you mean is you're not forming relationships with them. Mm-hmm. But like there's th- like there's that big of a gap where we're like super insulated. Yeah, I'm like, well, that might be a part of the problem is we don't know anybody. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I also think too that we all, we talk about the capital C church sometimes. We're in the Tri Cities. We're one church of many churches in the Tri Cities, and many churches that hold to very very similar theology. And I think that we we segment ourselves off from churches that are like-minded in a lot of ways that we could join together. Not We don't have to have like church together all the time or or at all, actually, but to have form relationships with Christians outside of our, you know, whether you're in a denomination or the Bethel Circle, to have a bigger witness in the area rather than trying to do our own things all the time and be like, well, we're not like that church, we're not like that church. Like, what would it look like to actually have relationships across denominational lines, if I could say that? You know, like to have Christians if, you know, at a Baptist church here at Bethel to have, you know, a Christian friend in a Methodist church or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran church who, by the way, hold to the Trinity, salvation by grace through faith alone, like very similar things in a lot of ways that we think, but to actually have friendships and be able to be on the same side of the kingdom as we all reach the same area. 
Do you think those are bridges on the same urgency as some of the bridges we talked about, talked about just a moment ago? The first ones you mentioned, the politics or the dem- uh, demographics, basically inside and outside the church. Such a hard one. I mean, last week we, we talked about that people will know us by our love. And uh, I think that the world, they do, they do look at Christians and say, why are you guys so divided? Mm-hmm. Like, why do I see so many churches that don't talk to each other? So I don't know if it's the same urgency. It's not the same urgency as reaching out to an unbeliever with but the you're gospel. you're doing it for that, right? Exactly. It's, it serves the purpose, though. That is like, I mean, really, though, I think those bridge builders are like our local agencies. Mm-hmm. They are the bridge builders that bring these churches together. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so I, I was doing a tour of Grace Kitchen the other day, one of our local partners. And so someone comes in and, and brings uh, these ladies who otherwise would have been unemployable. They're getting their jobs. Uh, for people who don't know what that is. Uh, so we, I came in and like someone brings them a lunch every day. And it was like a collection of different churches. Like mm. there's kind of usually one kind of main sponsor. But like this was, they're like, oh, no, we're all just friends. Like they, and yeah. they were from different churches. Like, yeah, they're friends. Like Grace Kitchen brought them together. That's cool. And like I think that happens in a lot of local. Mm. Like they are the bridge builders for different churches. Mm. Yeah. You know, one of the good. <clears throat> theologically, right? We know that one of the results, the biggest result of sin, is separation. Yeah, separation between us and God, separation between us and others, uh, even separation with our own selves, right? So I think a, actually a big part of the Christian life is actually recognizing these what we've called gaps. Yeah. It's this separateness that is everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, you go into your office and this person is not talking with that person, and there's a big gap between the boss and us, yeah. and so there. One of the things I think is one of the most powerful things that the gospel has is the power to overcome those gaps. Mm-hmm. It's the power to overcome separateness. The power, like one way we overcome things is through forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness goes over a gap. It creates, mm-hmm. it reconciles people, right? Mm-hmm. So in our scripture today, um, we're kind of continuing on with um, Cornelius. So Peter comes to Cornelius, the Gentile's house. Everybody's sitting there waiting for Peter to show up. Peter's like, whoa, man, look, this is unbelievable. Eats with him and stuff like that. And then he starts off with his message. <clears throat> and as the people are just sitting, or just sitting there just waiting for this message, waiting, waiting for this good news that are going to come from Peter's mouth, one of the first things he says is he makes a confession, right? He says, now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism. I, My translation says partiality. Okay, really yeah. good. So, I mean, let's just take a look at that. Like, what does it mean that God does not show partiality? That God does not show favoritism? Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, the, uh, where else does it talk about? James? Is it James that talks about? But the rich, the, yeah, a lot of, yeah, because specifically between the wealthy and unwealthy in James. Yes. Yeah. Which is an extension of, it's supposed to be an extension of God not showing partiality or favoritism. Right. No, for sure. Yeah, he says that explicitly. Man, super. If we if we think about this for too long, we're gonna be cut to the cut to the heart because we show partiality and favoritism in so many things that we do in life, and some of them are fine and merited, and that's and and I would say it's uh, a good part of society when we show some sort of partiality because it it it, it that's. You want to show partiality when you're choosing a babysitter for your kids, right? Like that's the like – you don't want to you don't want to just let anybody babysit your kids. You want to show some sort of favoritism because certain people are going to be – You want to make a respond. wise decision. Yeah. You want to make a wise assessment of a yeah. person's character. Yeah, right? but unfounded uh, partiality. Is that, am I saying that right? That sure. things are – that it's this is truly on the – well, here in the, in the case of Peter and Cornelius, the partiality would have been on his genealogical uh, makeup. And God does not show partiality on someone's DNA. Don't you think for most of us, we believe that our group, our tribe, our people, like we are, we are truly the people. And right. It's almost like God shows favoritism to us. Mm-hmm. And then, Everybody else is kind of ranked against us. I man, I I I almost wonder if like every culture on earth almost does that. Every oh. tribe does that. I yeah. Uh, I, I think it's interesting as you keep going to verse thirty five <clears throat> that Peter says, "But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right mm-hmm. is acceptable to him." Later on, it says that those who believe 
in Christ will be forgiven in his name. The fact that he mentions nations there, it's like Jesus isn't enclosed any, in any one na nation or national group. He's not enclosed, like he is the God of Israel, but he's not enclosed by them. So for Peter, that's like a, Peter knows it, that God is the God of all of creation, but God has been enclosed for so long in in Judaism that it's, it's shocking that he's now the God of all. But even as the gospel moves out to the edges of the earth, we take Jesus and we try to enclose him inside of our tribe or our nation. Like it's not just America that has nationalists. It's, it's all over the place. You look at the history of nations. It's like, well, God is enclosed in us. And if you're outside of us, you can't be a part of us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, he goes on. He says, Jesus is Lord over all. Mm -hmm. Like he, he stands above every nation, every ruler um, above our country and every other nation. And so to me, anytime you try to take Jesus and the gospel and enclose them inside your personal tribe or your national tribe, like you have compartmentalized Jesus in a way that he doesn't want to be compartmentalized. And you've almost said like to be, like I wonder sometimes for people living in our country, if we make Jesus so enclosed in our national identity, like what is it like to be a non-American in our country? <laughs> and like, what does it mean to, to, to know Jesus? Are people like, oh, well, I have to look like this and act like this and I have to be an American to love Jesus. It's like, no, like we are one nation who loves Jesus, just like the nations around us, but we're not enclosing him. We're not, we're not being exclusive to him because Jesus doesn't show us favoritism. We are one nation of many. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like yeah. That. Have you ever read the book, um, Jesus Made in America? No. I, it's, Should I? I mean, it's interesting. I don't know if I, I like everything. I don't agree with everything the guy says. Like, that just never happens. But a lot of what, there's a lot of core truth there. And part of his premise is that every culture, like, tends to make Jesus in their own image. Mm. And so he does straight up say, he's like, that's not just America. In yeah, that's not. Like, everybody does that. And, like, I think we even do that in our own subcultures more than mm -hmm. we realize, right? That's why, like, we, we can have, like, a, a, a more... I'll try not to take us into well. I will just take us into hot waters. <laughs> you, that's why you can sometimes you can have like a more conservative Jesus, right? Where really it seems like what he cares about mostly is like, uh, you know, your, your your gun rights, and he hates taxes. Uh, he he is definitely pro life, and you know he, he'll fight you if if you disagree. At the same time, you've got this really like more like progressive Jesus, who maybe main value is like just this inclusion and open-mindedness. And really the only person Jesus would hate is someone who's not as open-minded as we are. Like <laughs> no, we, we yeah. have these opposite ends of like who Jesus is because we've made him in our own image. And I think it's a scary thing when we come to church Sunday after Sunday and everything we hear, we're just like, yes and amen. Holy cow. That means probably we've made Jesus in our image because he's not challenging us anymore. Yeah. Dang. You just challenged me right now. <laughs> yeah, isn't, it, isn't it Keller who says if like, if, if, if God never challenges what you believe, you've probably made God into your own image. Mm -hmm. Something yeah, along yeah, those yeah, lines. I think, I think you're. Yeah. I think you're totally. Well, right. Adam, yeah, I was at the Richland campus here two weeks ago, and you you challenged us pretty well, mm. right on, on this on this very issue. Have you guys ever seen this? Okay, I'm gonna be careful sharing this since you are, <laughs> you try to get us in hot water here. But I'm trying, man. I'm trying to make it dangerous. So there is a there, there's a, there's a pastor I used to know years ago, and uh, very theologically astute. In fact, he was a professor down in Arizona or something like that. And anyway, he came up here in the Northwest. So we would have like meetings. After the meeting, uh, he would write a lengthy paper on like, brother, you said this. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> like like on this theological thing you said. And then he would correct it with like, like 10,000 words. Okay? It was like a lot. So what happened is over time, he started, like if you think of the pie of people you, rela you, you relate with as like it's a full pie, he started, oh, like, okay, you don't believe, like you're not pre-mill, boom. That's a slice of the pie, cut out. And then you're, oh, you're not this? Boom, cut out. Oh, you're this? Cut out. That guy literally got down to where his wife was chewing him out. She said, this is, this is horrible. We have no friends left. <laughs> There's nobody left. There's nobody left for you to fellowship with. Yep. It's like, it's, it's like sad. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, in, in, in his favor, he was like, well, because I stand with the truth. Right, and it's like, oh my gosh, man! But like, you're excluding everybody that doesn't hold to your narrow uh, 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 yeah. view of Christianity, yeah, of what, right. what your belief system is. There's a very readable book uh, that I'd recommend if if people are thinking about this, if our listeners are thinking about this. Unlike the one that Matthew is proposing. Yes, exactly. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bring, bring us back home, Brooks. Uh, this until is our, this is our reading level. Until <laughs> Unity by oh, yeah, Francis, yeah. Chan. Francis Chan. Yeah, yeah. and he has this 
chapter in there, uh, later in the book, he starts talking about his own certainty around spiritual convictions and faith convictions. And I thought it was very interesting that he's just honest. I, I'm assuming he's honest. He's like, you know, if you were to ask me how certain I am about uh, things like speaking in tongues and, and does it happen today or not, or how does it mean you say like, you know what, I, I'm probably about 80% certain on my conviction, but that still leaves about 20% that I'm kind of uncertain on and infant baptism. Should we, should, should we baptize infants or should we sprinkle infants or should we do a believer's baptism when someone can confess? Like, you know what? And he's like, I'm, I've thought pretty long and hard about that, but I've only come to about a 95% conclusion where it's like, there's still 5% of me that doesn't totally get, it. I still see a little bit of the value of the argument of, of infant, infant sprinkling. So I thought that was very interesting. And I, and I actually would challenge and say, that that level of uh, self awareness is is a sign of maturity in in your faith because if you read all of scripture, man, there are a lot of mysterious things in the book of the Bible, and there are a lot there are people way smarter than me on both sides of the yeah, aisle uh, that have spent a whole lot more time studying. Yep the nuances of theology that have landed in a camp that I don't necessarily land in, but they are to the bone convicted of it and more well-read and more well-thought than I am. So I'm like, I just, I, I, so I feel like that's a good place to be. And it kind of, kind of plays into this that, Hey, God does not show partiality. Um, there's room for a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of different opinions at the, the and not even just like, I mean, that's true with theology thing. I think that's just true. Like if we wanted a lesson on how to be a bridge builder, Mm -hmm. some of it would be learning that just, you know what? The other side is not stupid. (laughs) We always assume I'm the smartest person in the room and everybody else is an idiot. And yet the person sitting across from me is probably thinking the same thing. Like we, we, we paint everything in these just really broad black and white colors to make ourselves look smart, create straw man arguments so we can tear them down rather than assuming, you know what? Maybe someone on the other side is actually super intelligent Mm -hmm. and like, could teach me something mm-hmm. and I need to learn that too. Yeah. Well, and I mean, we, this is a, just a truism at this point, but I mean, the social media thing has, has reinforced those walls, made yeah. them higher and higher and higher because you can, you can sit there all day and just listen to your form of news mm-hmm. and yeah. all it do. Well, is the just, social media wants you to, it, yeah, it put, wants you to, to listen. put you in the yeah. echo chamber. Yeah. And once again, like that, that, that's the thing, like just what I said with like scripture, it, true with a lot of things in life. If everything I ever hear is like, just, yes, I agree with it. That's good. It's always good. It's all the time. I mean, that, yeah. you're probably not hearing something mm-hmm. then. Well, if we go back here to chapter 10, <laughs> Peter, Peter starts saying a few things, right? And then it says, while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. Mm-hmm. So you got all these Gentiles. It's all Cornelius, it's Bud's family, people that, that he, yeah, he cared room, about. Yeah. And I mean, Peter is absolutely stunned, right? I, I, I think we need to get a little bit into his head how... How mind-boggling this was mm-hmm. for him! You've, you know, he has seen in real in real life uh, what he cherishes cherishes, which is the, this promise of the Holy Spirit coming down, which of course fell upon him and his his Jewish mates, his in in group, yeah. his in group. Yes, of course they did. He did, and now is the, the Spirit of God has fallen upon these Gentile believers. Yeah. This is like stunning to yeah. him. Yeah, well, it's the promised Spirit they've been waiting for for years. The Spirit yeah. would come and inaugurate the new covenant and then dwell as people. And all of a sudden it's like, wait, you just gave it to us and now you're giving it to the Gentiles. And then mm-hmm. that's just the beginning of this snowball effect where in every every nation, in every tribe, every tongue, under every banner of flags, the Spirit is filling people. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. from Jesus, who's Lord over all. Like, yeah, I'm sure for in Peter's mind, it's like, and even as you read through Acts, he's still perplexed by it. As he shares the news with his buddies, like yeah, it happened, and like and I, falls back into his old ways. At yeah, times. which which still yeah. bl- it, it blows my mind in some ways because he knew he knew this was going to happen. Jesus, read John before Je- like Jesus said, this is going to happen. Spirit's going to fall. You're going to take. You're going to be my witnesses. Great commission, beginning of Acts, and yet he's still perplexed. And that just reminds me that we all, we know we know truth, and yet we're still perplexed yep. and struggle when God moves the borders of the kingdom into places we're not ready to go. Can can we go back to a little bit? Just I, I love this this opening. Is truly understand that God does not show any favoritism, mm-hmm. and then what happens between verse thirty five and verse forty three? Mm-hmm. What what, preaches what happens? The gospel, he preaches the gospel. Yep. And, and he, which talking about essentials, 
when he gets down to what are the the essentials between yeah. himself and these believers is like Jesus, the anointed one by the spirit who casts, like he, he goes to battle with the forces of evil and, and Satan is crucified, raised again, and then yeah. sent first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Like it's the gospel message that's compact and Peter's preaching it as, again, he's Lord of all. Like he's curious of, which is like the Greek word for, for Lord, ruler, like he is over everything and the gospel is for all people. And so that's like the bridge between Cornelius is like, why are you here? What did God want you to teach us? Well, it's that God doesn't show favoritism. He's made Jesus judge over all people. And that judge has now offered forgiveness of sins to Jew and Gentile. So it's like, it's like packed in there. It's just this gospel message of hope and peace, as Peter says, and forgiveness to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. Yeah. I just love that. The, the light bulb moment that he has that, oh, God does not show any partiality leads to proclamation of the gospel, right? That because God does not show any favoritism, I'm going to share the gospel with you. Uh, because God does not look at people the same way that I look at people, I'm going to share the gospel with you. That 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 is his next step, is getting to the essentials mm-hmm. of, hey, I want to get you saved. <laughs> yeah. Think about the truth that he says here, that Jesus is the judge. God has appointed Jesus to be judge of both the living and the dead. And then he says that God shows no partiality. Like we all, we've heard stories of judges in real life that show partiality in evil ways mm. that, you know, is persuaded through money or whatever the, the benefits are to let off certain people at the expense of the weak. And we look at those judges, we're like, those are terrible judges. And I would never want to like be in front of that judge or promote that judge. Those are stories that we're like, that's terrible. What do we do to the image of Jesus as judge overall when we show partiality to people? Like, do we paint Jesus as like a partial judge? Hmm. That's no different than the human's judge who looks at people and says, "Like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for their side." Like, what is the what is the cost of us showing partiality in the name of Jesus? You know, we can go back. Do you remember Adam the series we did on the Imago Dei, mm-hmm. the image of God? Nice, this nice base that God made all people in His image. It's almost like this takes it up even, ratchets it up even higher. That God God does not show favoritism or show partiality to various peoples. He doesn't have a ranking order of those who are higher up and those who are lower down. So uh, can, I, can I just ask, like, earlier I, I said that about, like, nationalism in every country, and I think it's, like, I love I love our country. I love being an American. I don't think we're perfect, but I don't see any problem with me being grateful for the nation I live in. And I love my family that I was given. I love the traditions that I've been given from my family. Um, I love being a West Coaster. I love all these things. And I'm sure our listeners have their own things. How do we enjoy those and live in those and love Jesus at the same time and not confuse those things that are my identity as a person and Jesus? Mm-hmm. Like how, how do I, how do we hold both of those without confusing them? Yeah. I mean, I think there's always like some tension there of like appreciating what God has given you, recognizing of course that you are not chiefly a citizen of any kingdom of earth but ultimately kingdom of heaven but like a part of like patriotism is just like loving those around us um and that's what we're supposed to do like god tells us to love our neighbors well and like when we follow those commands and like to be thankful for every good every good gift comes from him mm-hmm. like when you recognize who gave it and like there's gospel applications to um loving not just your nation mm-hmm. but also yeah your family tradition all of that stuff like there's a biblical way to do that and then there's kind of an anti-biblical way where we elevate that and say, then that's like the ultimate of everything that is God's purpose. How, how do yeah. you know when you reach that? So I would, you know. like, how do you know when you're like transgressing that line of mm. appreciating and giving thanks and then enclosing Jesus in those things I love? Yeah. I'll wait until Dawson calls me out on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> earlier in this message, it, it, it said it, right? Part of it is he is Lord of all. Mm-hmm. So there's only one Lord. Anything that starts to take on lordship that, that we love whether it's, uh, I mean, a, you know, a football team or my nation or my family or mm-hmm. whatever, we, we cannot, uh, as soon as we elevate that into the place of lordship, it's, that's idolatry. And that'll yeah. start sucking the life from us. It doesn't promote life. It takes life away from us. So I think that's part mm-hmm. of it is, right, is remembering who is Lord. Everybody, every, everybody submits to Christ. Yeah. Every knee will bow before Christ. Eventually. And we are wise if right now we recognize it, even if we don't see it, he is Lord. 
and every and every government is subject subject to him. So I'd say, um, culture is not sinful. No, um, culture is good. Culture is from the Lord. It we, can be sinful, but it's not sinful itself. That's where I was going. Yeah. Culture is not sinful, but uh, there can be parts of culture that are sinful or lead to sin. So. Um, having having your identity tied to some culture is actually I is not sinful. Um, yeah. You go, it's actually something to be celebrated. I I, I think you, you go around the world, and those of us who have traveled, who have seen different cultures and ethnicities, it's it's beautiful, right? The the way they celebrate certain things, and it's different than us. And there's something that's fascinating about that: the foods they eat, the music they listen to, how they dress, how they dance and celebrate and the traditions they have. But there are some things because um, man is sinful and there are parts of culture that, be- that be- can become sinful. So I think a good litmus test is like what, what, um, uh, what Dawson said that and if we take a step back and look at American culture, there, there are some things in our culture that are sinful that are kind of, kind of baked into our culture. Um, like it's, it's almost celebrated to be greedy. Well, that's, that's, that's sinful, <laughs> you know, right. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's celebrated to, yeah, f- flaunt your wealth or to, um, have multiple homes and, and not, you know, that in and of itself isn't, isn't bad, but that the heart condition that comes with it could be. So I would, there's the, you, you kind of have to dissect it a little bit mm-hmm. with the, um, a little bit and figure out or what parts of my culture are sinful and gosh, you know, I think I think we get a bit of an illustration to answer your question, Adam. <clears throat> if we go back to Philippians three, uh, Paul's talking about himself, and he says, "Hey, look, you get you guys are confident in the flesh." Here, here's where he says, see if see if this feels like a a he is pri- he has pride in this. He calls himself, "I'm circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the nation of Israel. Mm-hmm. I'm the tribe of Benjamin, <clears throat> the Hebrew of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, uh, regarding the law of Pharisee." Regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. So it's almost like he looks back on that. Look, man, I I, I have this awesome heritage. Mm-hmm. But then the next verse says this: "But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because mm-hmm. of Christ." Yeah. So it's like all these things. Whether you've got a privileged background, mm-hmm. you come from a glorious country, or you come from a country that's just like barely getting by. It's like, hey, I think you, we can go back to you, uh, Brooks, we can embrace that. But the thing is, compared with Christ, like, th- there's no comparison. Like, you know, it, it, the culture, cu- my culture is awesome it is, I can love it, <clears throat> but it, compared with Christ, there's nothing. Mm. I think that's good. Yeah, it's a good word. I think personally, we've just, yeah, we've got to make sure that as we're thinking about our relationship with God and what makes us acceptable to him is Christ. Yeah, It's not my family background, it's not, my culture, it's not my my nation that I live in, whatever it is. And like at a personal level, remembering that. And I think as pastors, like we were thinking about the church sometimes too, or oftentimes, like how do we how do we make sure that the culture that we create as a church keeps Christ at the center? Mm-hmm. So that in how we preach and teach and how we talk about our faith and the kingdom, that like the one who sits on the throne who like has a has a flag that that is waving is Jesus. Yeah. And I don't think it's the Christian flag, but it's some form of like, right, it's his kingdom. And so trying just to make sure that we're not enclosing Jesus in so that if someone were to come in with a different culture, with a different national background, that they might assume just on the way we talk, I must become these things to first be acceptable to God. Yeah. But it's like, no, wherever you're from, like, yeah, we happen to be in the wow. Tri-Cities. We all happen to be Americans and we love a lot of that. And maybe we've got issues with some of it, but we love it. We're grateful for it. But hey, we're, we're here to worship Jesus and he's on the throne in his kingdom and pointing people there. So no matter where you come from, you can be a part of what we're being a yeah. part of. And we're not asking you to step through hoops and to be to take on certain cultural attitudes and identities to become a yeah. Christian. Well, and they fought it out in Acts 15, right? And we're gonna it's see like, that. Are the, do the Gentiles yeah. need to become cultural Jews to be able to walk with Christ? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the battle's not done. Yeah. Nope. Just well, guys... Uh, but I really appreciate this good spirited and I think relevant, timely conversation. Um, I'd add it's probably we can say these things, but a lot of the love for our culture and these things is are embedded deeply in our hearts, right? So I think I think for all of us, what a great challenge for us is 
Man, as leaders in our church and to lead our church, Bethel, into church, you know exactly what you're talking about, Adam. Well, we're good. I think we went deeper into a, uh, man, a really relevant topic here today. Amazing. We're reading these words from 2,000 years ago, and they are, they are, it's as if they were written to us this morning at 9 o'clock, right? Guys, I, I just really enjoy pastoring with you guys, man. I just, I just, we have, the, the Lord has brought a great leadership team to our church. Well, once again, this is the Deeper Dive, where we go deeper into some aspect of previous week's sermon. If you want to find out a little bit more about us at Bethel Church, you can get on Bethel.ch. See you guys next week.